As Dave Roth once lamented, you can't get this stuff no more, but it turns out, in fact, you can. And Sammy told us it's about time. So turn your clocks back. We are the world's only dedicated Sammy Hagar podcast. This is the Bogus Otis Show. I am Bohost Brent. That is Bohost D. D. What are you drinking tonight, my friend? Tonight I'm drinking a lemon drop martini, two ounces of Sammy rum, sweet and sour mix, one ounce lemon cello, whip it up, ice, optional, martini glass, for sure. It's actually pretty good. Easy to I'll make. tell you what, you're the sweetest guy I know by far, so I hope you're enjoying that little drink. Listen, uh, you know who else is enjoying drinks? A whole bunch of Sammy fans out at the new Beach Bar Club Huntington, uh, you've seen some news about this, yeah? Yeah, I'm pretty excited because the last time I went to the Cabo Wabo Hollywood, it was an atrocious sight. It was very bad and uh, made me feel pretty bad because then nobody really there even knew who Sammy was. And then shortly after, he actually announced or his team announced that it was not really affiliated anymore and it soon closed right after. But the last time I was there was actually before the pandemic when it was pretty rough. So it was pretty sad. But two years before that, I was there. It was good. So something happened there just before the pandemic. But I'm happy to know that now he's got another Cabo Wabo legit in Hollywood or well, you know, California. Yeah, it's it's an it's a new spot, it's a new pilgrimage, and uh, another reason to book a plane ticket and maybe you and I'll make that trek soon for sure. So yeah, right. listen, uh tonight we got a couple of special guests, our old pals. We're talking the Hatfields and the McCoys, or our version, the Hagars and the Mick Roths. It's our special guest friends from the DLR cast. Yeah, it's Diamond, Darren Paltrowich, and Steve Lee Roth. Hey, guys. How are you? Hey, now. Welcome, Gentlemen. gents. Great to see you guys again. Do, do we call this a simulcast? What, what's the proper term when you do the crossover episode? <laughs> crossover episode. Crossover. Okay. <laughs> it's Let's a just... Roth over. Or it's a Roth very over. special episode. <laughs> It's not, the comb, not, the comb, not the comb over. That's for a different part of the <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I have a feeling we'll probably talk about that tonight as well. So uh, <laughs> we wanted to get together with you guys and riff a little and have a little fun because the last couple of times we've chatted, it's been pretty interesting and we've uh, done some deep dives and we're going to do that again. We're going to focus on uh, the 2002 Sam and Dave tour tonight, but we want to talk a little bit about all the craziness that happened from you can't get this stuff no more all the way to 2004 and the return of the red rocker. So, um, why don't we set the scene here? Let's cast our minds back to 1996, the best of volume one. There was never a volume two, but again, that's a whole nother topic. Um, Miwise Magic, can't get this stuff no more. Dave is back on the scene, MTV Awards, crazy stuff happening. Uh, did you guys watch that live? Dave coming out with the band live on the MTV Awards. I did. Did you, Steve? Yeah, I sure did. I'm having a flashback and getting a twitch in my eye about how nervous and just balled up going, this looks like a train wreck. <laughs> the moment he started dancing behind Beck there, you know, and that whole bit, I was just like, no, no, let's just, you know, even back then it was, there was those cringeworthy moments where you're just like, what the fuck? And you, I, I mean, had, had you put a mic in front of my face right at that moment and said, is this going to end in a horrible, miserable, you know, smoke laden failure? I would have said, yeah. And that's what happened. <laughs> Not to jump ahead too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you, you, you summarized it really, really nicely there. And, and uh, you know, even me as a devoted redhead, rockerite, Hagar fiend, uh, even even watching that moment for me, Roth coming back out, I was like, man, that this is pretty cool. You, you, you can't deny this. There's some there's some cool stuff here. And even though we knew what was probably going to happen, it just felt like one of the most amazing moments in rock. Indeed. I mean, I, I was truly torn. I was so excited, but also nervously scared. I guess I should have put it a little bit better. You know, I mean, it just it seemed a little awkward, seemed a little forced. But at the same time, I was just so happy to see this actually happening. You know, I so, just kept saying, keep it together. Keep it together. Come on. Yeah, keep exactly. It together, keep it together. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So something really funny, because I was diving into all this for research with that particular night is Dave Lee Roth, three different 
ways he tells the whole story of how he got back together with Van Halen. That if you follow the interview he does with Kurt Loder, the press conference one, the Howard Stern interview that's within a couple of days, that he tells totally different stories about how he wound up in Van Halen. So now knowing we, how we know Dave these days, it's like, of course that thing failed. But <laughs> I wasn't as skeptical when it happened. I didn't know any better back then. Uh, I think both Darren and I were watching the Rage Beyond the Stage stuff just to, you know, kind of <laughs> catch up with with some of this. And I I can remember that that little line with Dave, you know, when when he's talking about his book where someone had reviewed his book and he's like, you know, the, some critics said whatever it was, uh, it tends to ramble. And he's like, tends. And, and the, you know, that night was exactly that, right? All of those the press junket going from, you know, spot to yeah. spot to spot. And and it was literally like the story was evolving in real time. Yeah. So if I can, you know, hijack the conversation for a second, the, the one thing that Dave says that I have no idea what the hell this means. And he says it during the Kurt Loader interview, he's explaining that the reunion happened by, he was in, of florida on vacation and hanging out and recording and he read about some guy fell off of his bike and he didn't know what year it was and that how somehow correlates to him going hey i missed the 80s and van halen should be back and then by the time that the story progresses it's like he finds out that there's the warner brothers volume one greatest hits coming out and he's going hey what's the deal with this eddie <laughs> like a little difference between a guy falling off a bike, not knowing what year it is, that has nothing to do with anything. And he wants mechanical royalties, you know, a little bit different. <laughs> Sounds like a regular day in Roth. Right. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Same day he told those stories. How did you feel yeah. when you when you when you saw the walk back on the stage? How did you feel that Roth looked? You think he looked cool? How'd, what was your reaction to just how he looked and how he was dressed? I... I remember I thought he looked cool. I mean, for the most part, but for, for refresh my memory, I, I know we had that kind of shorter post crazy from the heat, uh, shorter post your filthy little mouth haircut kind of going doing the modern do and yeah. uh, a little bit. And then was he, he was wearing overalls, right? He he was, was wearing he, the way too high pulled up jeans. That like, was it. Like yes, that's citizen. right. Of course. Now I remember. Yes, that was a little Yeah, with the thin, that odd. really thin belt he had, right? Yeah. yeah. For, I thought he looked I mean, okay though, right? I was like, I, I I was like, okay, not bad. This could this could maybe work. I was feeling okay about it. I mean, I uh, thought I listen, I thought he looked really good. I thought they all looked pretty good. I mean mm -hmm. and it's funny because whenever I've seen press conferences through the years or even on stage. I'm so I'm so curious, especially if there's parts where I'm cringing a little bit or just going, oh, <laughs> is this going off the rails? I always look to see what the reaction is from the other three guys. And I will got to give them credit. They could win fucking Oscars because <laughs> I mean, you've never seen an eye roll. You've never seen them at mutter like, you know, what the fuck to each other. I mean, even at that moment, I mean, listen, uh, the the word hijack the event was thrown around a lot, you know, and, but Dave was and is the front man. It was and is well still now for no, for, you know, by no other choice. Uh, the front man, you know, was the mouthpiece was the guy that people wanted to talk to for the most part in a reunion. Yep. Yeah. The, he's going to have most microphones stuck in front of him, but there's a part of me that always just wishes in so many instances, hundreds of times through years, like, just dial it back a bit, share the spotlight, share the love a little bit, because you would not be there without those other guys. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it's like, if you look at Kiss, you know, Paul and Gene don't do any interviews together anymore. They did for years, right? But they don't do them for the most part. They do them individually, but yet there's still a mutually shared spotlight there, both in the interviews singularly and even together, you know, I mean, they're always asked, you know, uh, they're always asked, you know, about each other and paul said you know he's like the brother i never had you know what i mean there's always been some equilibrium right. there for two of the biggest egos right in the two biggest egos in the band the founding members of the band and that's the sort of thing i wish we saw more with dave do you know what i'm saying i mean some humbleness some like even from on stage to you know like it drove me nuts the things that he you know i mean he would announce eddie for the most part and alex but you know wolfie was like nice vocals wolf i mean I just wish there was more camaraderie, however, even <laughs> if it needed to be forced, because sometimes it would spill over and you'd really feel that love, right? But in 96, you didn't necessarily feel that. It was so short. It was a short fuse and boom, it was gone. Yeah. I mean, everything you just talked about there, like 
it seems like that's Roth doesn't really let that get out too often, which I was surprised because I mean I know we're jumping around here, but the uh 2012 different uh kind of truth had that bonus disc, the downtown sessions, where yeah. that's where that's the Dave. I'm like, that's be that guy for a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh, you know, was, they're all kind of in awe of each other, right? Was and respected the union, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, that- even let's fast forward to you know his uh, quote end quote retirement uh, audio clip that you know of of a couple of years ago or eighteen months ago, whenever that was. To me, that was the most humble I think I've I've ever witnessed him in an interview or in a in a moment. He he seemed very genuine and authentic in that, and you know m- maybe it was all fabricated and, and staged to, to to come off that way. But it, it seemed to me like his retirement moment uh, of last year was was like a, a as humble as humble could be. You that, you sounded, that's you what felt it, dis, yeah, you felt disappointment in there, even if Darren and I still can't figure out what throwing in the shoes means. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to be a, a skeptic because the more I dig into Dave's archives, the more I see things like in 1997 when he had Slaughterhouse, S-L-A-W, which somehow became DavidLeeRoth.com. I found this old archive thing when you go on archive.org and you can search old websites, it was a newsletter that he put out through there in 97, he was threatening to retire. So <laughs> you have that a little ain't enough video that ends with that joke that it's, you know, 2020 that he's retiring. Right. You have talking about in 1997, he's going to retire. Once you have that perspective, you go, Oh dude, he just threatens retirement. That's, that's his move. <laughs> Listen, in, in rock, we know full enough that retirement can mean a hundred different things, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, but with veteran acts in rock, you know, you could, I mean, for all you know, there could be bands that could sign a contract, say we are never going to perform live again, and then <laughs> they might rip it up, you know. I mean, yeah. It, you know, we never said we won't play live again. We just said we're not touring. However, a residency on a cruise ship, we can do. You know, that's I mean, right. So, how I, I, yeah, I never necessarily believed it that much. It could take many different forms, but, um, you know, I mean, going back to this era, I guess you could say, and I know it was a, it was a strange era for Sammy in a lot of respects too. I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of, I kind of will say this is kind of Dave's lost era, right? From after the failure, relatively more or less, basically, let's not sugarcoat it of, of your filthy little mouth to, you know, I mean, what was it? He had the Van, the Van Halen reunion uh 96 mm-hmm. crazy from the heat the book in 97 the dlr band in 90 so he was visible but there was no really huge tours there was these kind of you know the uh, there was tours after the dlr band i think and then it was kind of quiet right until the sam and dave tour which is that's you know i know we'll get into there so i mean it was it was an odd time i mean i was constantly looking what's he going to do next what and you know or what the hell happened after this and then in you know before all that you had the best of with the two new tracks so uh, you know you had these little glimmers of hope and you know only to be let down so I'm curious, you guys are, uh, are, are are deep divers on your show, and you're always digging for all of this interesting information. You know, Darren talking about some of the archival stuff and the research that he's done. Um, Darren and I were chatting before we came on the air about that sort of late 90s, 99, 2000, 2001 time frame, where there, there were some rumors that there was a couple of fits and starts, stalled, failed, you know, reunion mm-hmm. attempts with with Dave. Do you guys have any insight into what was happening there? Because again, you know, Sammy had carried on, you know, after marching to Mar- 10, 13, and it just, you know, his solo career sort of continued to evolve and he was, uh, you know, still out there in a, in a decent way. But there was always this little undercurrent after the Sharon era that, you know, Dave was going to be back. Do, do you guys... Do you, do you guys know some some nuggets? Are there some Easter eggs in there? I mean, I do, but I'll let you talk, Steve, if you want <laughs> on that. End. You know, the timeline is scattered. There's a lot we found out later after the fact. I mean, I think the general public's perception is that this is what we know. There's these, you know, here was the big reunion in 2007 with the the, the aborted reunion for a second in 96 and nothing else. But Darren found out a lot more and there was a lot more communication than I mm-hmm. think we thought, and I think even more than we know now, we know, but I think even beyond that, there could have been even more vis-a-vis maybe management, maybe, you know, over publishing all this other stuff. 
I mean, I think a lot of people think it was just this complete desert of communication. I mean, and yeah. until you would get these snippets where I remember there's a story out there where Dave, maybe it was in the Crazy from the Heat book where he just happened to bump into Eddie on New York City street corner. <laughs> you know, so it's like there was, a, I think, a lot more interactions than the public let on. And Darren, I know you can fill us in on that. I mean, we found out a while back on the podcast that uh, there was a good portion of uh, the different kind of truth record recorded before anybody knew it was recorded. Yeah, the that I think was kind of broken by Frank Meyer, who was supposed to write Dave's next book, where they were actually shopping it to publishers. And he's from the band Street Walking Cheetahs. And Frank has 20 bands at any time, and he's directing 10 TV shows at any time. He's a hardworking guy and a Van Halen diehard. And Matt, who was managing Dave in the late 90s into the early 2000s, secretly played Frank the sessions. And what he had told Frank, or at least showed Frank, was they didn't record the full songs. They recorded the first 90 seconds or so, because Dave was super gun shy about how the Van Halens were going to steamroll him with the business stuff. I think he felt slighted about the 96 reunion not going the way it was supposed to go. Because if you remember, they promised music videos for both of those songs. Mm -hmm. I think they promised additional songs beyond that. And they even told Dave that there was going to be a tour, allegedly, if you believe Dave, or at least that's what he said on Howard Stern. So I think he came into this going, hey, we'll write stuff, we'll do stuff, etc. But then the weird part about that is if you go to the 2013 interview and stop me if this is too rabbit holy I'll, I'll look for the hand signal or the, <laughs> the short time of the evolving so th one of my obsessions of the moment is this 2013 interview that dave did with usa today that contradicts everything that he said years <laughs> later and by that i mean he's talking about the john five album and he's describing it as a jukebox musical that he's written and how the van halens he showed them all these songs and then you fast forward, you know, to after Eddie died and he wrote somewhere over the Rainbow Bar and Grill because there's a tribute to Eddie. <laughs> so it was either an old song or it's not. And in that same interview, he said, you know, I haven't written a song with Eddie in 20 years. And you do the math on that and you go, but there was that early 2000s reunion attempt in 01 or 02. So. I think if you speak to five pe five people in that camp, you're going to get five different answers as to what happened, what almost happened, when it happened, et cetera. I'm still confused. Well, you know, this reminds me too, and Darren and Brent, maybe you can shed some light on this. Those two tr new tracks, were any of those leftovers from stuff that they tried with Sammy, were they reworked in any way? I mean, I yes. remember reading a couple places, right, guys, where I, one of those was a song that came from the uh, Sammy era, but you know, I also got you also have to add the fact that you know there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of you know Eddie noodling, <laughs> for, you know that turned into songs or just him and Alex are playing. But do, do you guys can you guys shed some light on that all on those two tracks? Because I'm I've been obsessed with those two songs for a long time because I I think a lot of people have forgotten about them and I I love them. Well, just totally they they kind of sit well with humans being. They kind of feel like when I remember hearing like humans being came out first and then the album the best of came out volume right. one came out you know. I guess the fall after the summer uh, humans being came out. I remember thinking these songs, you know, sonically and musically and tonally all kind of fit. Like they were all could have been done at the same session. Just swap out the vocal. Yeah. I, in terms of having facts, I don't being. exactly know. Right. But Brent, you might know. No, I don't, but, uh, but that's, that's a really inter interesting perspective. I mean, we've talked about some of these uh, bonus tracks here and there. And, you know, what, what if we had swapped something for a different album? We've chatted about this in the context of balance a bunch of times. Um, and, uh, it's, it does seem to me like you're, you're right. There's, there's some similarities there and, um, could, could Sammy have, uh, you know, ripped a vocal on can't get this stuff no more or me, me wise magic in, in the, the form they, they ultimately came out my opinion is no those are those are roth songs true and true and and i'm i'm with steve i mean i love both of those songs i always have um but it does kind of feel like there's the waters were so muddy in those yeah. years that anything could have been happening right you and if i can well. butt in for a second the video that came out after eddie died of eddie playing in jason becker's living room and he's just shredding you hear him play the riff to me wise magic that's right 
That's why I believe that the songs were already written. That's a good point. And you reminded me as well how much I absolutely, that was the same time frame, yeah, which I sometimes forget about, how much I love the song Humans Being. I mean, I absolutely, it's one of my favorite Van Halen songs, uh, Latter Day Van Halen for sure. I mean, one of my favorite songs is Sammy. It's a song that's just all powerful. And I, yeah, I think you, who knows when they were all, they were, may have been written, but yeah, they, that whole time frame as far as them coming out. It, you know, it also reminds me too that Dave was doing a lot of music then. We just didn't hear it all at the same time in different format. Because in the midst of this era as well, we had the absolute lunacy that was and is the No Holds Barbecue uh, art project, if you want to call it. And there's some amazing tunes on that. You know, the music beds and the songs themselves, the covers, the cover of Shine a Little Love by ELO, which I absolutely love. The uh, the the cover of Meat, the acoustic cover of Meat Street with the bongos. God knows I wish, you know, Dave, you know, would put these out in actual let's enjoy it without any artifice around it on Spotify. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, but that's, you know, that's my ongoing, one of my many ongoing frustrations. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that we know that was, you know, kind of, can we, I don't know if we can say it was good, but it was interesting that came out of these crazy years was the Sam and Dave tour in 2002. Yeah. Um, kind of, you know, incubated with, a, as we understand it, a little conversation between Sammy and Irving Azoff. And, you know, next thing you know, uh, the unthinkable is um, is happening. Um, Dee and I were chatting about this too, uh, you know, in the, in the lead up to tonight and, you know, what the motivation must have been. I mean, if you listen to Sammy, by all accounts, he's, you know, very bold in saying he had a successful solo career, was, you know, getting paid a lot more than Dave was, touring a lot more than Dave was playing venues a lot bigger than Dave. You know, Sammy likes to talk about how he's done everything better than Dave. We know that. Um, and in most cases he's right. Oh, see what I did there. <laughs> but you know, uh, do I interrupt you now or <laughs> because, because I have something that contradicts what Sammy says, but keep going, man. <laughs> I love this. So I'm going to ask for, uh, for my Darren to come to my defense here. Sure, um, Darren. It's, Darren won. It's, it's 2002, uh, you know, 1013 happens, interesting tour around that time. 2002, Long Road to Cabo DVD, largely based on, uh, you know, the, the happenings of um, bits and pieces of, of that tour. Um, what, uh, let's kind of go past and think about, Darren, think about uh, Long Road to Cabo DVD, looking back on it and, and seeing what was your take of what you saw based on that DVD versus what you thought when this big announcement happens in, you know, LA, April of 2002, the, the unthinkable was happening. Well, first of all, I could never like, well, no, actually I could believe that it could happen. I was kind of dismayed that it was happening. I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it at the time, even now, maybe not, but I mean, if I felt like this is better than just nothing. Uh, and I, then I realized they you know, were trying to make this happen to kind of get the, the brothers off their, off what Dave calls Howdy Doody Mountain uh, to start making music. But it sounds like it sounds like Sammy tried to get this to happen in 97 first. And it didn't quite happen at that point. But it sounds to me like if he was going to like if he was going to do that in 97, when in 97 do you guys or maybe, you know, did he try to get this to happen? Because he, you know, he charged out of the gate with Marching to Mars, which did quite well. Mm -hmm. So why, where would this come from? Was it? After much after marching to Mars, like why 97 well, if he was doing well, why would he try to instigate a Roth Hagar tour at that point? Was it kind of it was between album? Well, when did 10 I'm thinking, um, Mas Tequila, that album, God, I don't that know, was 90, it was barely now, it was 98, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, uh, 98, and then 1013 was 2000, 2000, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, was this kind of a, in a lull between the recording and touring cycle for him and a chance to make some really good money? Because certainly it was a, it was a, a good, you know, good time for Dave to make some money, I think, you know, I mean, because he'd been, you know, there was well, an idea. I got to interrupt here. Nothing. I have to interrupt here because what Sammy is saying, and he came out saying about two or three weeks ago about how basically he threw Dave a life raft because he was making five times the money Dave was per night. Somebody who worked for Dave on that particular tour told me that that was originally supposed to be the Kitchen Sink Tour. Not exactly that name, 
but that was supposed to be the Van Halens with both of the lead singers. And then it became what they called the non Halen tour. So Sammy's leaving that part out of history. So again, it's like speak to five people and you get five different chronologies and, and happenings and all that. So I don't know if I believe Sammy's whole thing that he did the favor on that. And that same person told me that that tour was supposed to go about 18 months and Sammy's who pulled the plug on the whole thing. And you go, well, how do you know that, Darren? Well, I found a California corporation called Hagar Roth Touring Incorporated. If it was supposed to be a two month thing, it you wouldn't file the LLC just for that. So we so, don't know anything. That's what I'm getting at. With that, is that alluding that maybe it could have been like a tour that went over to South America and beyond? Correct. I, I've been told it was supposed to go to Europe and Japan that tour, and Sammy pulled the plug and infuriated everybody. You know, it I was look I'm looking back. I saw that I saw that tour in Tinley Park out a uh, big shed, a big, you know, amphitheater in Chicago, like you know, twenty thousand people with the lawn, and it was packed. And I remember thinking that I'm thinking back now, I don't think Sammy could have filled those, done that kind of business by himself in places that size. Not that he was, I mean, he was certainly bigger than Dave as far as what he could fill. Yeah. But, you know, that was, I mean, really good timing for Sammy, Sammy as well, I think, as, you know, uh, as well as, as well as Dave. It's a shame it didn't go any further and farther than that. And I got my own, you know, bones to pick with the individual. Or at least one more show. did or didn't happen. Brent was actually at the gates. <laughs> what? Yeah, I was supposed to see the show at uh, at Darien Lake, just uh, outside of Buffalo, oh, which yeah. was the second to last on the tour, I believe. And uh, I drove down to Darien Lake, which, um, you know, we're, uh, for listeners, uh, Darren and I are about um, 45 minutes outside of Toronto. So for me uh, to get down to Darien Lake, that's an hour and a half-ish drive. And, you know, we bombed down there and we're all pumped and this is going to be a great show, great experience. We're in the parking lot at Darien Lake and we go for a wander up to the gates of, you know, the then amphitheater, you know, which wasn't quite what it is now at Darien Lake. And there's a sign on the gate that the show has been canceled. We literally found out that afternoon. And then, you know, this the story goes, uh, Sammy was sick, I think, was the, the rumor, the story, the whatever. But I, I mean... Uh, I don't think there was any uh, any flu going on there that was, you know, any any medical situation. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what again, what we know, it's still different parties telling the different stories. And ultimately, the kitchen sink tour was supposed to happen again in 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. But that idea was at least floating in the past. That we know. We just don't know if that 2002 tour was the first time or if 97 was the first time. When, no idea. When you think of it, 2002 would have been a great time for everybody because Van Halen 3 was a flop, mm -hmm. right? When did that come out? 98. 98, yep. 98. You know, Dave, Dave's recording career is basically dormant, you know, at that point, ZLR mm -hmm. band. Sammy had a good string of decent albums. I mean, not to, you know, name drop or drop anything, but I I, I had just started with MCA Records when that Moss Tequila record came out. And it we did big promotions with yeah, retail. We did, did well. this cool little EP with Best Buy with uh, a version of Right Now on it. And I remember seeing him at... Probably it was like a 3,000 seat arena somewhere. I was, I think it might have been in like Amarillo, Texas or something. And nicest guy in the world, as you guys, I'm sure know. And, but I can remember thinking it was like, yeah, I mean, it was a solid gold record. I mean, he was never going to hit those heights again with that he hit with Van Halen. I, but, you know, he was clearly enjoying himself and doing decent music. Fast forward a little bit, 2002, he had a string of basically decent performing records, right? You know, kind of not as not doing that huge business like with van halen van halen i mean van halen 3 was just the worst performing album they've ever had and dave's dorman mm -hmm. i mean it makes perfect sense to do that kitchen sink tour if if and if jesus if everything azoff couldn't pull it off then you know there was some things seriously wrong in the van halen camp then you know between the three of them and i bet a lot of it maybe came down to money as well so who knows allegedly allegedly uh <laughs> one more time allegedly dave didn't want to work with eddie because of his lack of sobriety at the moment and as we know the 04 tour eddie was in horrible shape and i think 
even into 06, that's when he finally went to rehab. Because when Eddie scored the, the that porn <laughs> for Michael Nin, you don't want to watch the the performances of Eddie uh, in that. He's not looking good. So it, it makes you wonder, how long was Eddie in rough shape for? Was it 10 years, five years? Well, reading Sammy's book, which was quite the eye opener, which I think he's so, judging by recent, you know, the comments since, Eddie's passing I think he really regrets airing all that but I mean I'm sure you guys have talked about that book a lot but that opened my eyes to a lot of what was going on I mean just and we saw it a lot of it but even more so I mean just it's really interesting to hear what Sammy talked about about when he would you know try to write some songs and just what was going on and I mean I I kind of believe Dave from that standpoint because it must have been almost it sounded like it was almost impossible to work with Eddie or to be even productive. But the thing is, like, you know, but if Dave could tolerate traveling across the country with his arch nemesis, Hagar, <laughs> who they never saw, you know, they had people keeping them apart. Couldn't they have done, just done that and kept him and Eddie apart? I mean, they traveled separately yeah, well, in their years anyways. And in 2002, you're right, like Roth, that's probably when he needed a shot in the arm the most, right? My thought is, I mean, it would have been keeping them all away from each other. I think it would have been about keeping Eddie upright. I mean, right. 2002 and, you know, the 2004, like you guys just were talking, the 2004 reunion, that that's what Sammy talks about so much in the book that was just like, oh, man, you, I just, it's, it was heartbreaking to know, you know, when we saw glimpses of that, I, I know from reading about the tour and, and later on seeing videos, I mean, it was, for most nights, it was pretty sad and very worrisome. Yeah. That's yeah. I, th- I, th- era I think- where, Ed, where Eddie pulled the gun on Fred Durst. Uh, that's an anecdote that's come out in recent years. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I have a feeling that it was it was around kind of early two thousand and three when we started hearing the um, he was he would call into the Howard Stern show and you know was talking about all this crazy stuff about how he was he was getting these bizarre medical treatments that you know weren't available to anybody else and it just these just periodic weird phone calls that he was he was doing with with radio shows and other folks and that and then you know the next page was the 2004 tour and then it sort of feels like the very next thing you saw after that tour ended was all of a sudden he's got his hair cut again you know with the frosted tips and he's all tanned and his teeth are fixed and he was at like a an indie or a NASCAR event or something like that. And, you know, it it was like, he was a completely different person. So, you know, you know, would he have been able to withstand the rigors of a kitchen sink tour in 2002, you know, any better than he clearly couldn't in 2018. Right. These, these are definitely questions and unfortunately the more time that goes by is the fewer answers we seem to have about what's unreleased from van halen is anyone doing anything steve always asks is alex ever going to play drums again will we ever see alex play drums again steve says no i say yes what do you two say i say no which kills me to say it kills me we were just talking about this and i think i was texting with you darren a couple days ago about now that Aerosmith has released their Peace Out video and it says the greatest American hard rock band. And I'm like, oh, that makes me upset to hear that. Yeah. I think the Kitchen Sink Tour right about now, with well, you know, with an Alive Eddie would have been amazing and could have rescued their legacy. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking too, looking, thinking back about the, the Eddie's problems and everything. I always got the impression that more so than Dave, Sammy had an incredible amount of patience and would have done anything to make anything work with Eddie because let's face it, it would have fattened his wallet to the nth degree, right? Not that that's his only motivation, but you know, Sammy's worked with, well, you got to have a lot of patience to have that kind of solo career and also a lot of drive and be able to go, yeah, you know, to try to make things work, I think. Whereas, I mean, you know, Dave is so ego and solo focused, not to say that Sammy is, and I think it's just a different dynamic with how they worked with Eddie. I always got the impression that Dave just, you know, my way of the highway lost patience was the immovable force versus the irresistible object, right? There's some <laughs> really wild physics there that when it connected, it was amazing. But when it didn't, man, it was like a, that gravitational pull was way off. Whereas two big egos, but Sammy, I think, always got, he he de- deferred to the Van Halens. They were there. They started. They brought him on. They, you know, they brought him back again, whatever, off the back and forth. I think he would have done anything for that, for that, to, to have, 
to you know get that phone call multiple times after 2000 after 2004 and before that well you know you think about that rage beyond the stage uh, those that I think it was about a five part series or something that was and uh, that that MTV thing and you know, we all know uh, the the magic of editing and the magic of uh, slanting a, a story one way or the other. But it was really interesting to me watching that. You know, Sammy was portrayed over and over and over again as this guy who was like, you know, I'm going to Dave's manager. I'm knocking on Dave's dressing room, going, "Hey, Diamond, you know, like let's let's go out and 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 it just Dave wouldn't even talk to him or acknowledge him if you watch that exactly with with that narrow focus so i wonder really during that tour what actually was happening were they having any communication was it sammy constantly going let's let's do something or not i don't know call on me call on me <laughs> you, you there sir okay <laughs> a lot of that is super super fake because dave is not generally at the venue for sound check for starters uh, I've heard story. Have you ever seen the sound check footage where it's just Van Halen sound checking a vocalist? They're they're just cutting the songs perfectly with no lead yeah. vocal. They were doing that on the Wolfgang touring. They were doing that with Sammy, etc. And you'd go, well, where was Dave? He was surfing. He was doing his walks. He was doing <laughs> all the the things that he wanted to do, and he just shows up right before the show. He's got his own dressing room, etc. And I know that because if I can tell a really quick story, as recently as 2020, March 2020, he had a new guitar player join his band who hadn't played on any of the shows and played on a Kiss show. He never met the guitar player before they hit the stage. This is the thing that I verified from a few different people. So Sammy could have been knocking on the door and no one is in the room or Dave wasn't there. That's what I'm <laughs> getting at. Why wouldn't he be friends with me? Because he's not there. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> now, if they were actually, if they were going to share a song, uh, what song do you think would ever bring them both to the stage at the same time? Ooh, good oh, question. You really got me. If you really got me, I was that was what I was going to say. Yeah, or a neutral song like maybe a Zeppelin tune or something. Or... Dave hates or... Zeppelin. I hear. And but I mean, but, but you, it, oh, yeah. wait for the bus. There you go. Um, yeah. But Steve, you said you saw the show, right? So how was the crowd? Were, was there a clear type of uh, winner between the two camps or was it just everyone's a winner because you get to see the best of both? It, it To my recollection, it was, it was kind of evenly divided. I mean, I may have been a bit louder for Dave because if I remember correctly, Dave, I think I want to say, and I, boy, people will remembering will correct this and I'm sure the interwebs could it, but I think Dave closed that show. Um, and I can be extremely biased and I'm, but I'm not going to tell you that, you know, it was a pro, totally pro Dave crowd. It was Chicago outside of Chicago. I mean, to my recollection, it was pretty evenly split. Personally, I remember being a bit more impressed with Sammy's show, which I had to grudgingly admit because I mean, I guess, you know, I shouldn't have expected anything more than virtually a Van Halen tribute band from Dave, even at that point. But I'm the guy who wants to hear the solo songs. You know, I want to hear a nice mix of it. And Sammy's got an amazing career and a lot more solo sales, solo albums that are more known and songs than Dave has. So it goes to thinking that he's going to throw in some of those songs with Van Halen. And I but suppose it, if you only hear five or six Van Halen songs when you're seeing Dave live out of, say, a 16 song set, 18 songs that you're going to, you're probably, most people are going to be probably pissed off and disappointed. Yeah. Cause he, he only played, was it Yankee Rose was his only solo song that he played on that. I, and I, maybe oh, it was Yankee Rose and God, maybe uh, on that tour, he Girls, did maybe? just like paradise. Just like, paradise. just like okay. paradise. Yeah. And he might've done California girl. I think the, it was California I'm trying Girls. to think about this. Cause I, when I interviewed Brian young, who played guitar with him for five or six years, Brian, was super he told me he was super psyched to be in that band at the beginning because they were only doing van halen and one and two pretty much and that's his favorite stuff and then slowly over time dave would be going well we should put in just a gigolo well we got to put in california girls well we got to put and he was putting more softer stuff and covers in whereas it started off as a hard rock thing at the beginning of the sammy tour i i i will tell you and i've gone back and watched so many videos over the years but i mean he sounded great 
The band was kick ass. Ray Luzier is a freaking monster, as everybody knows. I mean, that band was pure horsepower. I mean, that's the band I think that fueled one of Darren's all time favorite shows ever from overseas. So, but I mean, and I thought also the other thing too is, and let's face it, we I'm sure we all judge this if we're Dave fans. We go, fuck, he looks great. I mean, the yeah. long hair, you know, he was back looking like a rock star. Your filthy little mouth, the last time anybody really saw him on tour, right, was he was doing what I call the subdued GQ look where, you know, the smoky room with a white button down shirt, a black vest and black jeans. How do I know this? Because I have the your filthy little mouth tour book. I just yeah. tend to remember these. But, you know, you want your heroes to look great, right? You know, yeah. especially with Dave, who, you know, growing up to me, the guy was like a comic book hero, for God's sakes, you know. In sixth grade, when uh, Van Halen One comes out, I mean, I didn't know who Jim Dandy was. I mean, this, you know, there was him and Robert Plant and Steven Tyler, and you know, as far as the big, you know, these rock gods that just like look like they should be on the stage, on stage and off, they look like they should be on the stage. That was what Dave brought on the Sam and Dave tour. Yeah, I have to admit, I was watching some of the videos before uh, for tonight, and I was, I think, I was watching Camden, and yeah, he looked pretty good. Yeah, actually, I've forgotten. Uh, I haven't watched it in a long time, and Dave looked pretty good. I mean, Sammy, I wish he had. He just got his haircut, I think, on the Leno show not too long before this, so his hair was just starting to come back. So it was still short. I wish he had the long hair because they would have both looked like in in my mind in their prime, right? But I mean, I guess I'm wondering when, when you're watching the show, could you feel a little bit more electricity from both sides because they knew the other was following or coming afterwards, or was it amping I mean, up the whole crowd? Or for me, it was so long ago, man. I mean, whew. It's, you know, 2002. Um, I mean, I suppose if you asked me then, it would have been this. It, I probably would have grudgingly said Dave, but that's just my bias, you know? So. Nice. Although you did I, just kind of say you begrudgingly, and thanks for begrudgingly admitting it on this show that you like Sammy set better. <laughs> <laughs> but but if whole, I can, uh, on the whole, I mean, it. you know. If I can hijack again for a second, though, when in 86, when both Dave toured and Van Halen toured with Hagar for the first time, one of the things that people made fun of was how Dave's show was pretty much all Van Halen and a handful of solo songs, whereas Van Halen was 5150 and a handful of Dave songs. So already it's kind of like Dave was glued to Van Halen for the rest of his life. And the alternative was always going, what can we do that's not Dave? Right. And that's too bad because you think for the Sam and Dave tour, just out of sheer ego, Dave would have, you know, to show he's got some hits too to stack up against Sammy's solo career, he would have done stuff from Eat Him and Smile or Skyscraper or, uh, you know, even at that point, I'd love to hear stuff from uh, Little In Enough. Yeah, I mean, oh, wow. uh, Eat Him and Smile on its own was stacked with great songs top to bottom, right? It, and it, it it is interesting. So w was there a feeling that uh, this was a van halen cover band you know in as part of the, the band that he put together or you know was he really trying to be still himself dave focused or was it just capitalizing on the nostalgia of you know the classic or original van halen i mean it would to me it was dave focused but given the people what they want the Van Halen tunes. I mean, Darren and I have talked about this before. The last time we remember him really giving even close to equal, you know, acknowledgement, if you will, to the band in both photos on stage and the press was really eat him and smile. You know, since then it's been pretty much after Vi left and it, obviously the tragedy with Jason Becker, everybody else is pretty much kind of faceless. And it, that's always driven me nuts a little bit. And by that point, I don't remember if... If he did introduce the band in a big way, I would have remembered it in 2002, and I don't remember it. Yeah, and in that era, I think there was five guitar players in five years, something to that effect. It was really a revolving door. Now, Ray Lizier stuck around for a long time. James Lomenzo, I think, was in and out a few times, but he had a second guitar player for some of the tours of 03, 04, 05. Oh, I think there was another person that came. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ray Luzier left at a certain point. Jimmy DeGrasso replaced him. So, you know, Dave really had personnel problems from, say, Skyscraper Forward, because A Little Ain't Enough, different band from the album to the tour, and totally different band uh, from the European tour, I think, to the U.S. tour. Darren once charted it out, and Dave in his career has worked with 179 drummers. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but maybe maybe not by too much. <laughs> yeah, the the um the Vegas residency 
of 2020 is incredible because the the EPK footage that they were using was from the friends and family show. And he fired two of the guitar players you see in there and Brett Tuggle. So three of the three of the five people you see in there didn't even play those shows. And it was like two months later. Crazy. Did this uh did this flip a coin thing, you know, as the legend goes, we're gonna we're gonna flip a coin for the first uh show, and that's who that's who gets to close that night and then we're going to flip flop every night. I've heard some differing reports of whether or not that actually happened. And there was some shenanigans with some, you know, big, a big home show in LA or uh, a big show in New York where there was some shenanigans where I, I think the the one uh, legend tale that I read was that uh, Sammy was supposed to close and Dave uh, claimed that his tour bus broke down and so Sammy had to go on and play first. And, you know, Darren, maybe to your point, Dave miraculously showed up on time, just in time for him to make the stage and headline that night. Um, did, did do you guys have any sort of charting or tracking of, did that, were, were playing the alternating headline game happen? Or was this uh, the story of Dave hijacking whenever he could? I think that that's a made up thing about the toying, uh, toying. Co- that's one of those things where you, instead of saying coin toss, when you, once you get tired, you start to say coin costs. And that's <laughs> one of those ticks. Uh, I thought that, that the coin toss thing was made up, that that was a Sammy thing that he put out. Because I think I remember from that MTV or VH1 special where he tried to say that Dave, by showing up earlier, was claiming the bigger dressing room. And look at this. I can't believe this tiny dressing room. We can't even fit in there. I just thought that was acted out. Because when you're advancing a show with the production manager, they know what the evening schedule is for the night. Right? Well, Steve, yeah. am I crazy here? Yeah, no, you're crazy. right. You're right. It's everything from load in to rider yeah. fulfillment yeah. to yeah, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. They're not sitting around at 2.30 going, gee, who's going to open? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't believe that. I, I think that over time, people might have said things to Sammy to placate him a little bit. And, you know, he at the end of the day, you know, as great of a businessman he is as he is, he's a creative person and tour managers know how to handle a creative person. And who knows what lies the tour manager is telling the creative person so that they show up. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I gotta believe, no, I got to believe so much of that was negotiated and figured out way before. And I mean, if you've got if Irving, Irving Azop is your manager and you've got a whole retinue of people behind you, there's yeah. no way you show up and go, I got the tiny dressing room in a freaking huge place like Darien Lake where, you know, there's big rooms for everyone, I'm sure. You know what I'm saying? It's just it kind of I'm, I've always been a little bit incredulous about that. Plus, the other thing, too, is I think, you know. You mean if it's a flip a coin, you mean to tell me that it's not tails two nights in a row and Sammy goes on twice? Do you know what I'm saying? It's so it's got to be plot out. Yeah, that's like, true, right? There was never a. Know, well, never it's unbelievable. Me. It was absolute perfect flip flop on every date. You know, yeah. I mean, heads I win, tails you lose. God, right? That never happened. We <laughs> that never happened. We play touch football for God's sakes. You know, I mean, you flip the. <laughs> you know, I mean, so I'm sure it had to have been all right. I'm doing this, you're doing that, and then let the big fights ensue for some of the bigger markets, you know? It, so. it, can I add in one more thing as to why I don't believe that? And and I, and I do apologize for hijacking this. This is just such an awesome thing that somebody told me. A guy who who is in a band that sold a couple million records who loves Van Halen, he was telling me that on this tour, Dave brought out the triplets, the, uh, I think they're the Dom triplets who are from Uncle's Barbecue, and then he brought out the little person or two. So he was running what they call Club Dave backstage every night, uh, <laughs> where I think Frank Meyer talked about it on our podcast when he saw him in 99 or 2000 on the Bad Company tour. So if Dave in his rider was running Club Dave, which means he's doing the luau thing where you show up and you get the lay and he's got the bar and all that then they definitely had dressing rooms and hospitality areas set aside. That's why I'm further the skeptic. And Sammy did the same exact thing with the shot girls. Was that the tour where he would have the girls on stage as the wait, the strippers who were pretending to be waitresses pouring the shots for people? He did that in, uh, in 2006. That was the first time that you could get the, the ticket on stage to be <laughs> behind the drum riser. Yeah. Yeah. Genius. Well, yeah. I just would imagine Sammy being a booze kind of artist that he would have had a bar or his own 
Club Sam or whatever you want to call it backstage. Now, what I would have thought would have been the most ultimate prank was for Sammy to arrange just surreptitiously on Dave's rider a bottle of his tequila backstage <laughs> in Dave's dressing room every night or somewhere. <laughs> I'm with you. Well, that was that was the one thing that he said, right? Sorry, Darren. I just just to get this uh, point out, and then over to you. Another part of that VH1 special was that little clip again, which I'm sure was completely staged, where yeah. Dave was like sitting in his in his tour bus, and he's like, "Here comes Sam again, banging on the bus door." But what is that? Bottle of tequila in one hand, his dick in the other, right? <laughs> <laughs> And what do you guys do? You, do you believe uh, you know if other things were staged? Do you think the Kid Rock intervention, trying to get both on stage, was actually legit? Trying to get that to happen, or do you think uh, that was that was never going to happen, or just them trying to you know keep momentum for the tour? I've never heard about that. I've heard that Michael Anthony tried to do that, but I never heard that Kid Rock yeah. was that in the special that you're referring to. Uh, I was just reading it on uh, Ultimate Classic Rock, saying that at some point oh. he, I think, when the tour went through Detroit that uh kid rock showed up to try to get backstage to try to get them both i guess i guess before before the show he got them both to agree to it and then during the show i guess one of them backed or both of them backed out but it never did happen but i know that kid rock was trying his best to get it to happen i think it was scripted in the fact that kid rock came up with the idea didn't, and just went with it you know what i mean that's you know he was he's always been his own best hype man especially back then right so yeah. i would i would bet you this there was no knowledge of anyone's camp until he started you know getting on whatever radio station was in detroit or getting out there about it because that's totally the kind of thing you would do so darren you you just said something interesting you you threw michael anthony into the conversation I and mean, we know that mikey was out with sammy quite a bit on yeah. that on that tour um did uh was there ever any stories that anybody's read that was was mike was mikey actually trying to broker something did did he talk to dave at all or was he just hanging with sam on that whole tour and that was that did anybody, he was hanging with know? sam and he outright offered uh dave that he would play bass on stage with him and then in general he's going you two should hang out and allegedly he's like yeah uh-huh uh-huh right right mike right mike and just blowing him off and ignoring him because mike was attached to sam hmm. d had you, you heard anything about that i have not but i i mean i'm just going back to thinking about if the kitchen sink tour was supposed to happen just right around that time that was probably mike trying to still instigate you know perpetuating it becoming that possibly right by trying to do that because if they're out there, half of them are already there on the road. They're already there. You just got to try to keep it moving along. Maybe you can actually make it happen, right? Because the tour was doing quite well, right? It was doing pretty good business, right? Maybe yeah, it was actually I, start, maybe it was starting to get the attention of the Halen brothers. Well, that you, you just you just read my mind, and that was the, the next thing that I was going to ask you was, um, <clears throat> did anybody spot Eddie or Alex Van Halen at any of the shows? I wonder if they paid attention at all to what was going on there or if they were just completely turning a blind eye to that good good question good, good question i mean my i guess my impulse is to think that those guys lived in such a vacuum i mean you know eddie in particular as far as what was going on in the music world and pop culture i mean you know i got my peter gabriel so cd and i'm good you know what i mean that's like <laughs> yeah when when uh when did Ray Daniels pack it in with Van Halen? Is there like was he were they managerless during the Sam and Dave tour? Like who I was up? I think Ray Daniels um carried Gary Sharon's suitcase to the airport, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I, I mean I'm joking, obviously. I'm just but... wondering like who was managing was there were they managerless no. at that time? And yeah, like who question. was watching them during that time? No one? Mm -hmm. My assumption was that they were managerless. That, that I think so uh, too, right? Yeah, that that's my assumption that Van Halen, when there's not a tour, that they're mm -hmm. manager lists and they bring somebody on for a very reduced commission. And otherwise, it's just the accountants and lawyers and publishers just filtering it all through as on a need to know basis. Because you're right with like with Azoff, with Sammy having Azoff, who was managing Dave at that time? In early 2000s, it was Matt Sensio, brother of famed MTV VJ John Sensio. So Steve, you, I pictured that you were a fan of John Sensio. Am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, though. Like you mentioned before, like 
How could Azov have not made that happen, right? Made this kitchen sink. Well, well, he was at that time, he was just Sammy's manager, right? So he was in the Van Halen camp. But he ended up being, you uh, know, when I Roth came back, he ended up managing them, you know, different kind of truth era, right? Can yeah. I butt in here? I don't think that Azov was managing Sammy at that point in time because Sammy had a revolving door of managers in the late 90s, early 2000s that um, Miles Copeland for a little while handled him. Oh, the IRS. Yeah, he he handled him around the same time he handled Steven Seagal, hence Steven Seagal opening up a show for Sammy Hagar, which uh, it's worth reading about that because anything about Steven Seagal is worth reading about. But I think that I think that he changed managers a few times in that era, as did Eddie in some form. I could be totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah, because if you look at the Sam and Dave video, uh, Rage from the Stage, uh, Azoff is there with Sammy. And some of the some of the clips oh. he's standing there with him. You know, I now that I think about it, I think we got different specials in US and Canada because we didn't have a five part series in the States. We had basically a one hour VH one special. Yeah, there's a few clips hmm. where he's uh he's Sammy's going off about how small the room is, whatnot, and he's talking to A's office standing there. Oh, okay. I, I'm glad to know that I'm wrong about that. Because do you remember how when they were putting together the 04 tour, and Sammy talked about this in his book, that Azoff was ha who had to talk Michael Anthony into the tour, and that Azoff gave up some of his percentage allegedly, and so did Sammy just to get Michael Anthony on there? That's common knowledge, right? I believe so, right? Yeah that that seems uh, that seems accurate to me. That that's how I I remember it as well. I th I think there was some concessions that were made just because they they had you know tried to basically cut Mikey out completely, right? And yeah, I, I, I think there is absolute truth to the story that Sammy sort of said, like if 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 Mike's not 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 in, then I'm not either. Um, you know whether or not he actually would have fully stuck to those guns is debatable, I'm sure, but um, I do feel like there was probably some giving up uh, uh, percentage wise here and there to make sure that, you know, they could, they could throw Mikey uh, his due and, and have him out. Right. But then the further rumor that the Dave whisperer, the deep throat whisperer from the Dave and Dave Unchained podcast put out into the world that Dave was offered that tour in 04 and turned it down because he didn't think that Eddie was well. And that really changes everything right there because Azoff wasn't managing Dave ever, as far as I'm aware. Dave always just maintained like a personal assistant who he could tell what to do or an accountant. So how would that work that Azoff was managing Sammy, but Sammy would not have done that tour? How would that have worked? What a mess, right? I mean, I know. Do you, I guess, you know, just all in all looking back, the fact that they pulled this together, Roth and Hagar. Yeah. Did this, did it help the fans? Did it help the legacy? Did it hurt the legacy? Do you think it was a good thing they did it? Was it a bad thing? What's your thoughts looking back at it 20 years later now? I, I'll i tell you, I think it was, I think it was a good thing. I think it was, I, looking back on it, maybe it's hindsight's 2020, but at the time it certainly seemed to make sense. They're both out of the band from a business standpoint. God, what a great idea, right? I mean, if it didn't happen then, maybe it would have happened later. It just seemed, it made perfect, in my mind, it always made sense. I'm, uh, you know, I don't think it did much to further anyone's career, but I think it was, if you had a checklist of things you wish would have happened with Van Halen and associated members, that could be on there. Why not? I thought it was good. Smart. Did good business. I mean, it, it also like at that point, 2002 was, uh, you know, it's four and a half years since Van Halen three. So like there's four summers, four and a half summers where yeah. you know, no one's hearing this music, really. I mean, Sammy's doing his thing, but he had a lot of, you know, his own records out. But I mean, a lot of the stuff is just sitting there dormant and no one heard anything from Van Halen in four and a half years almost. Right. Yeah. Good good point. Which at that time, I think was probably the longest they'd gone with doing nothing. Yeah. The and, last real yeah. thing they had was the release saying that Sharon was gone and they was just quiet for years. Right. And it gets further weirder when you think about this, that did you guys ever watch the live video that they made with Sharon in Australia that never really came out, but it's on YouTube? Yes. Fully produced. Then Dave on the Sam and Dave tour fully produced that Hartford show, which you could see on YouTube, and it never came out. So that started the streak of 
or continued the streak of Van Halen finishing things 99% and which means 0% in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, we could both do multi-part episodes of lost opportunities. I mean, <laughs> just <laughs> for, for both Sammy and Dave and for Van Halen in total. Yeah, that's such a true story. I mean, you, you see uh, over the over the last handful of years, so many cool things that have come out. <clears throat> pardon me, from other bands. Oh. Um, package this and special that, and a limited release this, and all of the things that they could have put together as a package around some of these tours and some of these videos that have leaked out there. In part, you just go, man, like w- with a bit of a strategy and some cool packaging and a couple of things people have never seen before. Um, you know, you want to talk about selling more records and and, and yeah. driving more merch sales and like it was just so many missed opportunities. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. I, I I wail about this all the time, but the fact that there was never an Edom and Smile tour home video release to go up against uh, Live Without a Net for God's sakes, what a lost opportunity! I mean, that tour had the biggest lighting rig in history. You got this amazing, you know, band that would hold its own when Dave left the stage for God's sakes. You know, I mean, the when Vi and Sheen would, I mean, that would have been one where we would have been arguing for ages that the Edom and Smile home video was better than the Live Without a Net video. You know, I mean, that that would that would have cleaned up some serious business. And then do another one for Skyscraper. I mean, you know, Kiss for me is always a blueprint for so much of what so many bands especially from that era should have done, you know, to this day. I mean, you know, they did an amazing box set. They, you know, the off the soundboard stuff, the, yeah, you can, you can say, you know, Gene never misses an opportunity. Listen, I don't want David Lee Roth condoms or, or, or a casket, (laughs) but as far as stuff that gets out from the vaults, you know, or stuff that basically they're giving what fans want at the end of the day. And and that's Lord so knows. true about Edom and Smiley because uh, Pete Angelos started as like Van Halen's lighting director. You yeah. think you know they had that the biggest lighting to rig, like you said, at, at, in history up to, up to that point. Just Here's for that alone, vis- you think they'd release it to show it off, right? Here's the most visual leaning guy in hard rock at that time, maybe ever. Yeah. You've got the greatest freaking videos for create uh, for uh, going crazy in Yankee Rose. Throw that on the back end of it. I mean, the, God, the sky could have been the limit with that thing. It, it just uh, so tomorrow, if I can self plug for a second, purely accidental, but related to what we're talking about tomorrow, I'm going to have the pleasure of interviewing David Coverdale again. You know, speaking of people named Dave, who had Steve Vai play guitar for them, who are about 70 years old, who have canceled farewell tours, a lot in common right there. But you look at what Coverdale and Whitesnake have done for every single Whitesnake release. They've given us a deluxe box set. Yeah. And you're telling me they didn't record all those Roth shows? Like the, he's playing Monsters of Rock and they didn't record it and they didn't put the soundboard. You know, it's crazy. It so I just look at everything that Coverdale does and I go, Roth, you should be more like Coverdale. Uh, in terms <laughs> of the the output, the fan-friendly packages. Kiss totally correct. And that is why we just see the Van Halen legacy dipping and dipping and dipping and other bands who are not as great thriving the doors still have new music coming out in 2022 that's why when i saw that aerosmith video i mean i look i like aerosmith but i'm saying when i saw that video saying you know declaring themselves the greatest american rock band you know who's left to really say that or not right it should it should be van halen yeah Totally. It really should be Van Halen based on the quality of the output. It should be Str- Stranger Things should have used a Van Halen song, not Master of Puppets. All <laughs> these shows should be using Unchained or You Really Got Me or Eruption or something like that. And they're not. And like Kate Bush getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> Everything is wrong right now. <laughs> Well, look, man. When you talk to Coverdale tomorrow, can you please let him know he owes me seventy nine fifty because I, uh, they when they released their tour, didn't quite really say that they were opening for the Scorpions. So I, <laughs> I bought my ticket thinking I'm seeing him. Next thing you know, I'm seeing the Scorpions. Come on, Dick Coverdale. It's a shame that last tour didn't just yeah. was you know abbreviated because of his he wasn't sounding good. I hate to say, but um, you know these last couple of White Snake albums I absolutely loved. Yes. It's just. I mean, uh, Doug Aldrich and Red Beach in that band and uh, just, you know, he ca- he not only create new stuff, but also fair to the legacy of what came before. You're right. I mean, and, yeah. I mean, you know, Dave alone, but 
Lord knows, I mean, we've all lamented and talked about this, what should be, what we wish was happening with Van Halen reissues. Yeah. And you just, uh, you know, mentioned Doug Aldridge. I, I would love to hear Sammy or Roth play with Aldridge, man. He's great. Oh, that's an episode I've been formulating for a long time. It's like the people that Dave could be calling with a snap of, you know, snap of his fingers, who I wish would create and do stuff with Dave. Yeah. <laughs> leaving out the Eat and Smile Band, leaving out John Five. The list is a mile freaking long, yeah. you know? He could do it all in, in that sense, but uh, Lord Coverdale, uh, I will see, I'll see what he says in response. If you formulate that into a question for me, I'll ask that. And uh, if I were a betting man, I bet he calls me darling as part of the response. Cause that's a <laughs> darling. <laughs> Just and tell him to come uh, back to Canada, please. Yeah. That, that's 7950 Canadian dollars is what uh, Darren <laughs> He's probably got that in his pocket there too. Yeah, sure. He probably. Can. Probably sure can manage that. Listen, um, this has been a blast. I think uh, there's a few lessons here. Um, the biggest lesson in, is we have so much more that we can talk about, and we are going to keep talking. And uh, look at us. We played nice in the sandbox yet again, <laughs> right? Um, well, we always do. So, you, you know, awesome. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly soil that by saying, you know, I'll, I'll take your lead. David Coverdale should be more like... Uh, or David Lee Roth should be more like David Coverdale. Should yeah. David Lee Roth be more like Sammy then as well? Is that what should happen or no? Sometimes from a marketing standpoint, <laughs> I'll tell you. Touché. I, I think that David Lee Roth should have had a spirit. And uh, I'm just going to say that. Like a liquor. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. I, I've always maintained and I've always had trouble kind of uh, explaining this, but Dave's, um, you know, Dave's passions are so varied and so <laughs> all over the place. Couple that with ADD. I mean, it's like, just, I don't, you know, he can't, will never, ever couldn't do just one thing, even in the best of times. You know what I mean? I mean, he always had such varied interest. If The fact that he became an EMT, for God's sakes, that he will pursue any passion he wants and, you know, to hell with the critics or to hell with what anybody else thinks. Well, look, if Roth was going to do a spirit, I already know what the name would be. Drink, the original. <laughs> well, well, I, I that would have been the perfect thing to go out on, but I'm not going to let you end on a high note here. I'm going to ask, <laughs> Darren. did you guys watch or listen to, rather, the Roth Show episode that came out today, May 8th, 2023? Uh, I have not yet, not but yet. It, is, it is on my bookmarked to listen list are you gonna are you gonna share a little snippet with us okay i am so confused about something that he's saying in there he's talking about how he lives in the inner city and how it's a lifestyle choice to living in the inner city and the dude lives in a gated mansion in pasadena <laughs> wait a I minute was... how do you know he's not talking about tokyo darren because he's not living in japan <laughs> he could be back in tokyo <laughs> for all we know at this moment so so what I'm getting at is either, and one of one of our listeners was messaging me about it. He's going, well, I think that all those segments are pre-recorded in old stuff, and then he's wrapping around with the stuff where he's talking to Tom, which really hurts my head a lot to think about. If this is the best of the best that he's thinking that needs to be unearthed, and if so, why is he talking about living in the inner city when he's living in a gated mansion that has like ten foot walls to keep people like us out? Hey, we do we do believe though that somebody is over there is listening to the DLR cast because we have said on more than one occasion that he should be featuring some of his solo music in these damn podcasts. Guess what? There's two songs been. from your filthy little mouth in this episode, which as far as I know is only on YouTube, at least from this afternoon. I mean, and no one puts show notes. God forbid you put show notes in your podcast episodes. It's oh, Steve. show episode 11, <laughs> and it shows up on YouTube. And I haven't looked in a few hours, but it wasn't on Player FM. It was, I mean, who the Steve, hell knows what's going on? I have to interrupt. You cut yourself short there. Which <laughs> song from Your Filthy Little Mouth is in this episode of the two that you talk about every other episode of the DLR cast? Uh, I would be that reggae parody, No Big Ting. <laughs> no Big Ting is in the background of this. So I think they're trolling us now. <laughs> nice job, guys. 
No, I know. Uh, I know. You guys always mention that song. Yeah, I I love everything that you've just said, and you have no idea um, how desperately I keep channeling the word codfish in your guys' favor. I <laughs> can't tell you how much I'm sitting by my bed at night praying, saying codfish over and over and over Thank again. You. Yes. Um, listen, guys, we're we're gonna do this again, and maybe again, awesome. and you know, maybe maybe again. Um, <laughs> 2002 you guys. was a crazy time. Yeah. Um, it, it was uh, it, it, it was an interesting time in this band. It was fun to look back with you guys. Uh, we always enjoy. Uh, we love Dave. We love Sammy. We love it all. Uh, we're gonna do this again, but for now, it's the Bohos out. <laughs>